Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I'm Evelyn Marcus, and in addition to being a psychologist, I'm featured in the documentary about anti-Semitism, Never Again Is Now. I am a Dutch Jew and a daughter of Holocaust survivors. In 2006, I immigrated to the United States because of the rising anti-Semitism in Europe. I am Phyllis Dimbler Miller, the founder of the free nonfiction Holocaust theater project, ThinEdgeTheWedge.com. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, Elgin, Illinois, and where I was the only Jewish child in all my classes. And it was not a Holocaust community. It was a community of people whose parents and grandparents had come the turn of the past century running away from the czar. So it was quite a shock when my U.S. Army officer husband and I were stationed in Munich, Germany, only 25 years after the end of World War II, and this changed our lives forever. E.J. Kimball is the director of Christian Outreach and Engagement at the Combat Antisemitism Movement, a global grassroots movement of individuals and organizations across all religious faith, all religions and faith united to combat anti-Semitism. EJ is a foreign policy and national security consultant with 15 years experience working in Washington, DC. He is specialized in government relations and building strategic alliances and serves as the president of EJK Strategy. EJ, it's great to have you on our show. Well, thanks Welcome. for having me. And it's good to see you again. And I get to ask the first question today. Is there something in your personal background or family history that motivates you to do the work you are doing today? Well, yes, uh, to, to put it simply. <laughs> yes, yes, there is. I'm, I'm Jewish, uh, born and raised, and have, have two children. Uh, who are in elementary school right now, and, and one in elementary, one in middle school. And, and while thankfully they have not experienced uh, anti-Semitism specifically, just from my, my experiences and, and just following what's been happening in, in this country, in the United States, it's something they're going to experience. I've, I've experienced it in in minimal degrees, I would say, certainly nothing compared to what others have, but some of that latent anti-Semitism, when, when I was in, in uh, getting my master's degree, I was focusing my, my research on Israel's West Bank barrier. That was the, the title of it. And, and I presented it, my position, what the US position should be uh, to my class. And when I finished, I had all the students coming up to me, uh, my classmates, saying how great it was, how objective I was and sort of laying out the, the, the issues. And, and, you know, I don't come off sort of looking as the stereotypical Jew. I, my last name is Kimball. It's a, you know, English name. It was, you know, changed when my uh, great, great grandparents came over from, uh, from Russia, uh, from that region. But I thought, you know, what if I look different if I sounded different, you know, in that stereotypical, you know, Jewish, if my last name was Goldberg instead of Kimball, would they have actually said how objective I sounded? Uh, or would it have been more, sounds like someone who's Jewish, who's trying to promote the a pro-Israel position? And, and I've sort of found that at times throughout my professional career, uh, some of the, the comments that, um, sort of have a little bit of that latent anti-Semitism in there. Uh, and, you know, it's something that obviously uh, is, is problematic and needs the attention. Thank you for that answer. Very, very interesting. Evelyn? Um, EJ, can you please tell us a bit more about the com combat anti-Semitism movement, about its mission, its structure, its strategy, and what it's focusing on? Yes, so the combat anti-Semitism movement, and you can visit it at combatantisemitism.org, is an organization that started about three, a little over three years ago now. It, it started to build a, a global grassroots movement of, of people, organizations, 
not to recreate what's already being done in, in the world to fight anti-Semitism. I mean, there are plenty of organizations that have been working on this issue, but you know, even looking at groups like the ADL, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and you look at organizations that are well known who are very proactive in combating anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is not going down, it's rising. And so the combat anti-Semitism movement's sort of mission was to try to fill the gaps and to help connect organizations that are working on fighting anti-Semitism, to connect them with each other, to in some ways serve as an incubator, in other ways to serve as a networking uh, entity, to hear about different organizations, what they're doing, connect them with others, and where there are gaps, that's where, where we step in. So one of the initiatives that we launched during COVID, you know, COVID hit at a, uh, at a precarious time for many people, but for us especially, we were just over a year old and starting to hit our stride into that next level and then the world shuts down. So what do you do? You know, we were planning to do these events, these big in-person events. Well, that's all out. So we obviously shifted to the digital sphere. And, and one of the initiatives we launched was this global mayors initiative. And it started with a, a summit for mayors, not just from big cities around the world, London, Paris, et cetera, but also from small areas like Bell Harbor uh, in Florida. And for, for mayors to learn lessons from each other about things that they've done that work, things that may have not worked, but also to learn those lessons and figure out how you can apply them in your own cities. Because what happens in the United States, you know, the, the laws that we operate under here are different than all the different European countries. And so it was a, a way to share that information, but then it's not just to have a summit, that's fine, but what do you do afterwards? So now it's the connections that have been built there. And so these mayors are communicating with each other. So that's that's just one of those examples of, of where we, we fill those gaps. And, and we're looking for partners to engage with us. If, if partners have ideas, if groups have ideas, to combat anti-Semitism, innovative ideas uh, to, to attack this, we're looking to help. You know, if, if it's a matter of you know, scaling up, that's something that, that we look at partnering on. If it's just a matter of uh, promotion, we have a network that we can help promote these, these activities. So we're, we're trying to fill these gaps and to amplify the message that others are doing. I'm going to heat Great. you up for a, a spreading information about my free nonfiction theater play, by the way, because that's exactly that kind of ability to spread information is really wonderful. And I think the mayor's is a genius idea. I'm thinking of my hometown a thousand years ago and how the mayor would not have known even that there were Jews within his town and how important that this work that you're doing can be. So the next question. You try to engage Christians as partners in the battle against anti-Semitism. Why is it important for Christians to fight anti-Semitism? And why is this alliance important for Jews? So the issue of anti-Semitism and, and really going again to the reason for the combat anti-Semitism movement being created is that anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. We have to understand what anti-Semitism is. And, and those that are anti-Semites, it's not that they are just focused on Jews. If God forbid the Jewish people were to disappear from the earth, anti-Semites would not turn around and say that, great, the world is free of Jews and let's all live together in peace. They will find others to focus their hatred on. So this issue of anti-Semitism, it is a scourge on humanity. And, and to understand in, in this country, in the United States, you know, going after Jews, Christians also uh, are targeted for, for aspects of their faith and their, their uh, ability to practice their faith freely and openly. And, and while today we're not seeing in general that type of uh, hatred towards Christians in this country, this is where things eventually lead. 
when there is hatreds allowed to flourish in societies, it ultimately turns on others. And so that's that's the importance of, of engaging in Christians. And obviously, uh, Christians and Jews have a lot of shared uh, history. Uh, there's good, there's also bad uh, in the history. And and it's, it's just very important to look for allies in the world. You know, everything is not perfect. Uh, you can look at a situation, you can either look glass half full, glass half empty. If you want to look at why Jews and Christians shouldn't work together, you'll find it. Uh, if you're looking for the aspects that we have in common, that we can work towards a common good, then we should. And that's, that's the importance of of engaging with our Christian partners, and for that matter, with our Muslim partners and with others. Thank you. And I'm just thinking how, because of a question I was asked recently, how important it is for people who aren't Jewish, but who have good intentions to realize some of the times the things they say, they don't realize are actually anti-Semitic. So by working with Christians, I assume you are educating them as to certain things that they might not even realize they're saying and not say them. Yes, that, that's exactly right. And, and education is really the biggest tool that we need to engage in this fight right now. Uh, there is, I was talking to a colleague last week and, and he mentioned in the church, anti-Semitism is not an issue that gets raised. The word anti-Semitism is not one that gets talked about. You know, when pastors are, are giving their sermons, they're not talking about anti-Semitism. The people don't know the terminology. They don't understand it. Um, you know, when we talk about anti-Semitism, uh, the former special envoy, uh, Elon Carr, says we're talking about Jew hatred. Now, Jew hatred is easy to understand. Yes. Anti-Semitism, people hear that. You're against Semitism. You know, they're trying to figure out what it means. Jew hatred is very easy to understand, and that's what we're talking about. Anti-Semitism is Jew hatred. But what's important is to understand that there are different levels and different ways that it manifests. And that's, that's where the education really comes in. Because everyone, for the most part, understands anti-Semitism that's deemed, you know, from the right. I don't like using right and left, uh, but for, for the sake of uh, common knowledge, Anti-Semitism from the right, the neo-Nazi, you know, is the KKK, that sort of anti-Semitism. For the most part, people recognize it, they reject it. Uh, it's something that's shunned by society. The part that has been harder and, and more people are becoming aware of is what's deemed the anti-Semitism from the left, which is the BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement Against Israel which is not about Israeli policy. It is about Jewish people having their own independent state and going after the legitimacy of a Jewish state. And these are the sorts of, of actions that on the, uh, from the left uh, is really important to understand that anti-Semitism manifests itself, I think today, uh, this this anti-Semitism from the left in a more dangerous way because people don't recognize it. Yes. Exactly. And that's where there's a big threat to freedom of speech in, in this country is guaranteed by the First Amendment. And there's a lot of horrible things people can say. You know, there's a lot of talk about the hate speech exception to the First Amendment. Well, there isn't a hate speech exception. That's what the First Amendment does. It protects the speech that people disagree with. To, to a degree, there are some limitations, but it's not protecting speech everyone agrees to because you don't need to protect that speech. And so this anti-Semitism from the left that, that sort of tries to hide behind this free speech, there's, there are aspects of it that need to be properly understood in what exactly, it's not prohibiting people from saying that, if you wanna come out and say you hate Jews, you have, you have the First Amendment right to say that. But there are also mechanisms that governments can use to say, if that's the position you hold, then we're not going to work with you because it runs afoul of our public policy, not the type of things that we want to be promoting. 
And so there's, there's a lot of education that goes into it. There's a lot of, from the legal side that, that comes into it, that plays out through the courts in this country and I'm sure in countries all around the world. Thank you. I really appreciated that extra explanation because I think it's very important. So to go back to Christians in America, are American Christians perhaps more active against anti-Semitism than American Jews these days? I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, I think there's, American Jews are very active against anti-Semitism. There's, there's degrees to which attention is focused on different aspects of anti-Semitism. Uh, American Christians are getting more engaged on it, and especially within the evangelical Christian community. But even within the evangelical Christian community, there are aspects where some of the younger generation are harboring more anti-Israel sentiment, which is not necessarily anti-Semitic, but starting with the anti-Israel sentiment makes them a little more... Uh, um, opposed to even hearing about anti-Semitism and, and the issue because they're immediately putting it into the context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So uh, I think Christians are getting more engaged today. I would, I would definitely say that Christians are, uh, the engagement rates are probably higher, but I still think Jews overall in America are more engaged in, in this fight against anti-Semitism. But that's something that we're working on. And, and I was speaking to a group of uh, uh, 50 key uh, evangelical pastors in Dallas a few weeks back uh, with this message, which is we need you in this fight. We need you to get your, you know, your congregations in this fight uh, and to educate them and, and to really be able to, to engage more and to join with us to start calling this out more. So EJ, you, you, you just said before in a former question, you, you, you said in your answer that um, Christians would, it, uh, one of the motives for Christians to, or, or one of the reasons for Christians to fight also anti-Semitism is because, or Jew hatred is because Hatred won't stop with the with hating the Jews, right? It will affect all kinds of religions, all kind of minorities. Um, so that's a reason for Christians to fight anti-Semitism as well. Um, is that why? And you just said in your last answer that um, Christians are getting more engaged these days in fighting anti-Semitism. Now, part of the mo motivation will be that you reach out to them and, and motivate them to do it. Mm -hmm. But is it also that they see hatred in general rise and think if we don't fight all hate, including Jew hatred, we will be next or we are already a target? I, I think that there's, there's a couple factors, but I, I think one of the most important on engagement with our Christian partners is their love of Israel, uh, especially within the evangelical community. There's been a, a movement to return to the Jewishness of Jesus. Mm. Jesus, Jesus was a Jew, uh, a practicing Jew, and there's a lot of uh, there, there's big movement towards adopting Jewish practices within the evangelical community. Uh, including celebrating Shabbat to some extent, lighting Shabbat candles um, on Friday nights, these, these aspects. So when it comes to Israel and the Jewish people, there is a love for Israel and the Jewish people. Now, um, I, I was, uh, we, the combat anti-Semitism movement sponsored, we were one of uh, three sponsors of the Breakfast to Honor Israel at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, uh, I think it was last month. Hard, hard to keep track of dates. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, our keynote speaker at that, it was combating anti-Semitism was the theme. And our keynote speaker there was Reverend Johnny Moore, who was the president of the uh, Congress of Christian Leaders. And, and he talked about 
the need for Christians to engage. <clears throat> and he even mentioned the fact that within Christianity, you know, he said, how many Christians really know their, their Jewish brothers and sisters in their communities? And, and he said, you know, just to <coughs> go out and, and speak to your Jewish brothers and sisters. And he said, with no other motive other than, hi, I just want to get to know you. And, and the key part of that, which sort of, you know, the giant uh, elephant in the room is the history of evangelical Christians uh, trying to convert Jews to Christianity and this hesitation to work with the evangelicals. And, and I think part of that comes, you know, your questions early on about engaging with Christians and, and benefits for Jews. What Reverend Moore said is, and if, you know, the Jewish person looks at you suspiciously, you have to recognize that they have a reason for it. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to try to engage, but he said, you know, just go with no other agenda, just to get to know them. And, and those are, you know, that's where this evangelical Christian movement has been going and why you're seeing such an increase in engagement in this fight to combat anti-Semitism. They want to get engaged. And we're working with our partners, the, uh, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, the ICEJ, their branch here in the United States, we're working, they've got curriculum for Christians to learn more about anti-Semitism from the Christian, you know, speaking from a Christian perspective, uh, communication and how, you know, having information is great. But if you can't communicate it effectively to an audience, it doesn't matter. And so the way that you communicate anti-Semitism to Jews is different than the way you're going to communicate it to Christians and to Muslims and to uh, non-religious entities. If you're just looking at governments, you're not going to talk about the religious aspect in the United States. You're going to talk about crime and violence and, and hatred and, and how it impacts economics in society. I mean, there's there's so many factors you have to be able to communicate it effectively to the different audiences. How, could you give us an example, EJ, of how, uh, what is a good way to communicate about anti-Semitism to a Christian audience? Well, I, I, the way that I generally begin that conversation is focusing on the, on the Bible. It's, you know, why should Christians fight anti-Semitism? Well, let me, let me take a, a big gigantic step back because we haven't talked about this yet, but there is a uh, widely adopted uh, international definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, it is a non-binding definition. It is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, it is accompanied by 11 examples of anti-Semitism, which includes sort of the classic anti-Semitism as well as modern examples of anti-Semitism. And that's where the shift is from attacks on Jews to attacks on Israel, you know, in, in general. Um, and when you look at attacks on Israel, criticizing Israeli policy is legitimate. Holding Israel to a double standard that other countries are not being held to, that's where it, it rises into a level that could be anti-Semitism. So denying the Jewish people the right to a homeland, that is something at the level of anti-Semitism because you're not talking about just policy, you're talking about the existence, which is no different than what it was before the Jewish people out of state, which was the Jews shouldn't have a right to existence. Now it's the Jewish states shouldn't have a right to exist. And when you look at it from a Christian perspective, I mean, God promises the land to the Jewish people, not for 20 years, but for eternity. So from a Christian perspective to understand the reestablishment of the modern state of Israel in 1948, uh, that this isn't just a new state that was formed, but a reestablishment of something that goes back 2,000 years, and that something promised by God in the Bible 
to deny that is to deny God's word. And as a Christian who believes in the Bible, this is something that is uh, incontrovertible. You know, this, you can't push that aside. Um, and so obviously that's an example for Christians. If I'm speaking to, uh, um, you know, a mayor in, uh, I live in Rockville, Maryland, I'm not going to use that as my argument if I'm speaking on a political level. Right. Um, you know, these are, but that's, that's one of the ways of communicating it with the Christian audiences that sort of lays that foundation uh, in, in different Christian audiences. That's the other part is you always have to be adapting. Uh, it's, okay. That, that, that clarifies. Yeah, that clarifies it really well. Thank you. Um, what do you consider to be the biggest threat to the Jewish people these days? Uh, and, and does this affect Jews globally or in specific regions of the world? How do you see that? Yeah, I, I think it's the uh, this these double standards that are held. Uh, I, I think there, there's, let's take it on the global level right now. Uh, we see pretty much widespread global condemnation for what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Meanwhile, uh, Hamas has started firing rockets from Gaza into Israel. There's been no condemnation. I believe I saw today that there were some rockets fired from Lebanon into Israel. Um, no, no condemnation. When it's happening to Israel, or as pre-1948, when it's happening to the Jews, right. people don't, don't care. It doesn't get the attention that it needs. It's this double standard that's, that's applied. So that is one of the problems. See, wh what's happening in Gaza, if these rockets continue to happen, Israel's responding, but this is sort of the, uh, the low level uh, you know, rockets, which you know, is sort of ludicrous sitting here. If one rocket fell in, in Rockville, Maryland, being <coughs> the capital, uh, this would be a whole game changer. In fact, yeah. last week, uh, the US Capitol was evacuated. Uh, in the evening, I think around seven o'clock, uh, a plane entered the airspace. Well, it turned out that it was the Washington Nationals baseball team, the stadium, which is right there, was doing a, uh, had uh, a group of um, members of the army were parachuting into the stadium. Well, that caused the whole capital to be evacuated. Uh, so you can see just that minor threat. Meanwhile, in Israel, rockets get fired there and it doesn't even have a blip on the radar uh, in the West. So that's, that's one of the areas because it normalizes this violence against Jews. Uh, the other is the rhetoric uh, that comes from the left masquerading itself as anti-Israel policy, but is nothing short of anti-Semitism, this sort of latent anti-Semitism that goes after the legitimacy of the Jewish state and by um, connection to it, those that support the Jewish state or who identify as Jews. Uh, during the aftermath or even during, uh, but carried over the aftermath of the war last May in Gaza, there were college students, you know, Jewish college students who were part of these Black Lives Matter movements and, and these very progressive groups who were given ultimatums. You can't wear a star, David, and be part of our group. You're either with us, which means against Israel, and you essentially relinquish your Jewish identity, uh, or, or you're out. And they, they were not allowed to participate. There was examples, and we, uh, some of those were highlighted uh, through our newsletters uh, that we put out weekly. I mean, these are the sorts of things that get normalized and need to be called out much stronger. So that brings us to the next question. What can individual people do? How can they call such things out? So first, go to our website, combatantisemitism.org. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, that will be the first step to help get you educated and also to share with, with your networks. The, other, uh, the next step is if you come across something, through our website, you can send in uh, tips of what you're seeing, if you've got stories that need to be told. These are all areas that we're able to help 
uh, get this message out. So I would say those are two, two very uh, important first steps. And, and you know, the third one is to really get educated, utilizing our, our website, utilizing the website of our partners. And you can see all of our partners through the websites. We have a list of organizations. Uh, they are, um, you can click on them and go straight to their websites. So if there are groups that are working on these issues in areas specifically that you're looking to engage, we can either connect you or you can make those connections yourselves using our, our website as a resource. Thank you, Evelyn. So what should be done against anti-Semitism in general? Not only by our listeners, but in general. Yeah, I, I think in general, there, there's a few steps. And, and the most important one is adoption of the IRA definition of, of anti-Semitism. So I, I mentioned it earlier, this International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. It's been adopted by over 35 countries around the world. It's been adopted in the United States, I believe, and my numbers may be a little bit off, but over 20, over 20 states, it may even be 25 states. And some of that is through uh, executive action at the governor level. Some of it's through the legislatures in these states. Um, at, our, uh, at our executive level, uh, the Department of Education has adopted it. The Department of State has adopted it. Uh, President Trump, when he was in office, uh, um, issued an executive order that expanded the use of the definition. These are things that need to be adopted by police departments. Uh, police departments need to be trained in understanding with the adoption of this IRA definition to understand these 11 working examples, modern examples of anti-Semitism to see that, for example, if there's a crime that gets committed and someone's brutally beaten and it's because the attacker says, you Jew go back to Israel, the person doesn't have to be Jewish for that to have been an act of anti-Semitism. The intent was anti-Semitic. These are the sorts of things to, to call out these types of hate crimes. Uh, but you can't do that if you don't have the knowledge and experience to understand what you're seeing. So the training and education ac across the spectrum is very important. The other part, which, which you know, what, what generally tends to happen, especially in our country in, in the US, when we talk about going after a specific type of hatred we tend to then have the chorus that says, well, we shouldn't just go after one, we should go after all forms of hatred. Well, if you go after all forms of hatred, you're not gonna actually go after any form of hatred because it gets too diverse and you can't focus on identifying that specific one. General issues of hatred, sure, hatred is bad. You know, we should be against all forms of hatred, but you need to then dive into each one of them. And so the calls for education about, um, you know, the uh, about anti-Semitism and what constitutes anti-Semitism today, these modern examples need to be taught within its own, not as part of a broader hate, you know, anti-hate campaign. It needs to be very focused. We certainly need to go after hate against other minorities, absolutely, but that needs to be a separate lane. It cannot be all lumped together uh, because you know it becomes too chaotic. Yeah. And too hard for people to understand. People are very good at specifics. Generalizations is kind of too nebulous. So what you just said is so important. Do you have any last words to add to it before we end? Well, I, I would just strongly urge, first of all, thank you for, for having me on and giving me this opportunity to speak to to your, your viewers. And yeah, I, I would invite everyone to, to check out our website, combatantisemitism.org. I'll put it in the, your bio in our page. Fantastic. Um, to, to join the movement and to edu get yourself educated on this. When you see an issue that's concerning, that, that disturbs you, uh, don't just 
watch it and then turn away. Do something about it. If there's, if you are not Jewish and there's a, an act of anti-Semitism in your area, reach out to, to your Jewish neighbors. Uh, I think Reverend Johnny Moore's point, if you are not Jewish, you know, if you're a Christian and you're, you're looking to, uh, to fight anti-Semitism, you have to first get to know your Jewish neighbors. You have to understand the people who are the main targets of anti-Semitism. Uh, so I think really getting to know, know your neighbors is very important and not to sit back and just watch it and move on with your life, but to, to engage. Can I add something here and see your opinion? Growing up, as I said, where I was the only Jewish person, I told people I was Jewish. And I still see people who are uncomfortable telling people that they're Jewish. And I feel, because of my background, it's really important to tell people, not yelling, not saying, how dare you say that. But if someone says something that's an anti-Semitic trope, saying, you know what, I feel badly that you said that, I'm Jewish, let me explain. Now, do you agree that we should, as individuals, you cannot agree, have the courage to just, among non-Jews, explain what we are? I mean, I explain that I take off with Shabbat. I want them to understand that we have certain rituals. So do you have any comments about that in your last words? I, I think everyone has a different level of comfort into how open they are and how much they like to share. I mean, a lot of that, Evelyn, I'm sure you could speak to this a lot more than I can, but uh, the different personality traits, introverts, extroverts. Um, I, I will say that in this country, it, well, when I first went to Israel in 2006, the most striking thing upon arrival was the tour guide showing his big star of David around on his necklace. And he said, see, in the United States, you don't really see that. You see Jews who wear small ones and usually they're tucked in under their shirts, but you see people wearing big crosses in the United States openly. In Israel, he said, Jews here wear our big stars of David openly, very proud of it. And I think you know that's part is a, a feeling of uh, being comfortable, uh, feeling secure being in the state of Israel in the lone Jewish state, that you're not worried about what people are gonna think if they know, uh, you're not worried about anti-Semitism in Israel, not to say that things wouldn't happen, but you don't worry about that there. Uh, but there's a history in this country and it's a history that just doesn't get talked about much, uh, but it's there, it's real. And because of it, some people would rather just go about their lives, don't need to promote being Jewish, uh, it's something that I make it a point, especially speaking to Christian audiences, because I don't come across uh, as Jewish. I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that they understand where I'm coming from so that they don't think I'm a Christian speaking to a fellow Christian. I want them to understand that I'm a Jew uh, who's speaking to them, but I'm not trying to promote my agenda. I'm just trying to educate. Uh, but I don't want anyone to be able to then come out and say, you know, don't listen to what he said. Did you know that he was Jewish? You know, that sort of, you know, someone who has their agenda, an anti-Semite who's trying to downplay and influence an audience, I want to be as transparent as I can. So I, I just think for each person, it's it's a level of comfort and, uh, you know, really just depends on, on their audience. Thank you. I appreciate that response. And I thank you so much for coming on today. We've so appreciated it. I thank our listeners. And I want to say for any of you who have not seen Evelyn's fabulous and very informative documentary, Never Again Is Now, please do see it. You can see it on Amazon and YouTube. And also more information about my free nonfiction theater project, thenedgeofthewedge.com is available with its resources. And for everyone, without putting yourself in physical danger, please speak up against anti-Semitism and hate whenever you can.